um, to the last, welcome to the last but one uh, of the Golden Jubilee Lectures. Uh, in the 50 years that it's been in existence, one of the very important things for the center has been uh, to cultivate its linkages with other countries in the region uh, and also uh, with other parts of the global south. And therefore, I extend a special welcome to Mamadou Diouf, who's Leitner Family Professor of African Studies at Columbia, and also the director of its Institute of African Studies. His uh, most recent publications include Tolerance, Democracy, and Sufis in Senegal, that he has edited, uh, and which came out uh, last year. And there's another uh, uh, work that he co-edited with Mara Leachman, titled New Perspectives on Islam in Senegal Conversion, Conversion, Migration, Wealth, Power, and Femininity. There's also a very nice article in uh, uh, the Public Culture uh, Multi Issues in, two, uh, in 2000, where he discusses the way in which the Sufis were participants in a vernacular modernity in a vernacular cosmopolitanism and the ways in which they both negotiated and resisted colonial power in Senegal and eventually also many of them became traders in peanuts. So they became part of uh, a presence in cities and subsequently they also became part of an international diaspora uh, and which has facilitated uh, uh, Muridism as global re-Islamization. Now, Senegal is acclaimed as Africa's most advanced democracy, um, and, that, and, and for this the Sufis uh, have played a major role. Uh, I also chaired a talk uh, some years ago by Al Stepan, where he uh, spoke about rituals of respect. So, um, we really look forward to hearing you about Sufis, uh, and about Senegal. So, yes, it is. Good evening. I would like to thank you for your generous introduction. And I would like also to say that I'm very honored to be associated to the celebration of the 50 years anniversary of the of, of, of the center. And uh, your introduction shows actually something which has been always important for me because of where I was because of where I was born. I was born in a city which is called Griffith. Let me is a small city which is here, not very far from the capital city. And it became one of the four communes. And the first one is Sanwi, which was created, I didn't talk a lot about that, uh, <coughs> for making of a Muslim community and a Muslim civility. Sanwi was created by the French in 1562. And in the context of a French Revolution, the inhabitants were able to fight to become French citizens. And from the French Revolution to 1887, Saint Louis got an island off the coast, Rufus, and Dakar, the last of the four communes, became uh, uh, a French city actually in 1887. And the tension and the negotiation between Islam and civic values which are attached to the French Revolution became an important element of the identity of the Wolof, which is the main group I will be, I will be talking about. 
the word of God lived in this region, which is called the Central West, the Central West of, 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 of Senegal. And, 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 and the colonial governance of Senegal was divided uh, uh, between the four communes, on one hand, along the Atlantic Ocean, and the rest. So what you have is an urban population who were French citizens. And sometimes they became citizens before people who are today part of the French uh, uh, metropolitan space. And the rest of the colony, which was a classical colony with colonized subjects. And the kind of Islam which will develop in the two zones became also an important uh, aspect of the discussion of what is called the success story of Senegal. And you know, what Al Stepan has talked about in what he called the return of respect. He borrowed actually from Rajiv. And this is really interesting to see how an experience, which is the Indian experience, is being used to describe an African experience. An experience which is defined, has been defined, has a success story. Probably the only quote-unquote democratic success story in, in, in Africa. For many reasons. The first reason is that it's a country which transitioned from one party system to a multi democracy system in 1974, which is that it's the first country in Africa which transitioned and began the democratic transition before. We did have the democratic transition in Africa, which is 1994. The second element which is interesting is because of the transition, we see the country which has only eight years, eight years of a one-party system, which was the dominant government system all over Africa. It's from 1960 to 1974. It's a country which has never experienced a military coup. Because we had a president who kept actually governing us through opening intellectual discussions. I knew who was Tagore when I was 10 because he kept citing him. <laughs> he was a poet. I read Nehru the Discovery of India when I was 15 because of him because he kept telling us that we had to leave. So it's interesting to see how this, you know, how this context, which is an intellectual context, has played a key role in defining what will be also known as the Senegalese exception in relation to other countries. No military coup. It's a country also which wants the first country in which the president resigned. In 1980, December 1980, Senghor decided that he was interested in going back to what he knew better, writing poetry. And he resigned after, as he puts it, this is also an important element in the discussion, training someone to replace his prime minister. Because in 1970, we have a constitutional reform which established the role of the prime minister. And this is also an important element because this is the beginning of a shift between a political approach which was based on a language which was a local language in which Sufism and Sufi leaders have played a key role to a much more technocratic language. What I'm really arguing is 
the history of these models, quote unquote successful models, was based on a system which was the product of the interaction of the Wolofs. Why the Wolofs? Because they were living in the area where peanuts, the main product of the colonial economy, was present. So they were able to negotiate a kind of peasant in the colonial system which allowed them to participate in the building of a culture, an administrative and political culture, which was, which actually included their resources. And their resources were their language, which became the language franca of the colony in the early 20th century and their religion, Islam, to which the script is associated, which allowed them actually to claim that they were civilized. They didn't need, they didn't need to be civilized. That they had a tradition of discussing Plato and Aristotle in Arabic. If that is civilization, they are civilized. So they don't need the French to be civilized. So, 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 and it is really an interesting, uh, I think it's important to, to understand that, uh, you know, that what has happened in the history I'm going to present is the production of a political culture, which is the colonial culture of Senegal during colonial rule and after which was co-produced. It was not imposed by the French, but it was co-produced. And it was co-produced with people who kept fighting the French by claiming political rights, but refusing, resisting assimilation, French assimilation. And Islam became the main instrument of their resistance reading the Quran and remaining polygamist was key in their strategy. Which is also something interesting and has played also a role after colonialism. Is why I was saying that the explanation of the so-called success story is, you know, uh, based on this political culture, which remains the political culture of Senegal until now. But things have been changing. The system has been always redefined and readjusted. But today, the system seems to be at risk for different reasons I will talk about. But if I continue talking about the success story, the other element which is also very important. So Senghor resigned, he was replaced by, by, by his prime minister, Abdul Juf, who was not a politician, was basically a technocrat, but he inherited the party. The party was called the Progressist Party. It became, in 1974, the Socialist Party. Senghor was claimed to be a Marxist, but a kind of anti, as he puts it, an anti-Leninist Marxist. Senghor was able in Senegal, you have to imagine a country where the president shows up on TV and for one hour we give a course on how to use a comma in sentence. <laughs> 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 And why is my column is so difficult to use? He had given all this. But he was also able to show up on TV and for two hours give a, a lecture on how to read Karl Marx, saying that don't read the Marx of the capital. He doesn't understand what is going on. Read Marx, the historian of French social movements. So, 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 so this has also played a role in creating a political culture which, on top of this 
world of any Islamic culture, you have also a kind of Western ideological discussion which is also linked into the production of this very, very important uh, political culture. So, a Jew who replaced Senghor was defeated in 2000. His party, who had been in power since independence, was also a defeat. So the transition from one system, from one regime to another, is also one of the key elements in the definition of the Senegalese, in the definition of Senegalese. Uh, uh, success story and uh, uh, Juf was defeated by what? An economist who created the Senegalese Democratic Party. What himself and his party were defeated in 2012. So this is a country which has already experienced to, 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 to regime change and as I say, both experiences are explained in relation to the Sufis, in relation to the system which has been created since the colonial period. And, and the history is basically a history of transition and, and negotiation. And the system I call it the Islam world of system. And this is the system I'm going to describe and analyze. Uh, analyze. And it is the product of two processes, which uh, you know one simultaneously: the colonial expansion on one hand and the consolidation of Islam on the other. And the two processes have been into negotiation and produce very, very important uh, studies which shape the way in which the collaboration, both ideological and institutional, was defined. As I say, the model has been constantly revised and renegotiated from the firm establishment of colonial rule, the end of the 19th century, to the present. So what is happening today is these last two decades in particular, the model has been under attack from within, but also from without. And, 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 and these attacks are interesting if we want to understand really what was happening. So briefly, a history of, 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 of this region to actually try to explain Explain the model, its construction and its unmaking, at least for me. This region is in the pre colonial period called Senegambia because of, of, of the Gambia who is inside the belly of Senegal, as they say. You know, Gambia was a, a British colony. And, and the whole region is this, actually part of Guinea-Bissau and Guinea, part of Mali, and part of Mauritania. And until the opening of the Atlantic economy in the 15th century, this whole region is part of a world economy, which is a Saharan and a Sahelian uh, uh, world economy, which is that the main political units were in the internet. The coast was not occupied or the coast was under the control of the politics in, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the internet. With the development of the Atlantic economy, you have a kind of shift from east to west, and a shift from north, the axis which was an axis north-south, an axis which become an axis which is 
east-west. And the main polities uh, emerging in the context of the slave trade are actually slave kingdoms. The two most powerful was one located here, Kayor, I studied, and another one which is called Bawal. And, 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 and the kind of system which was operating is a system in which very early the response of Muslims, communities living in this region, is a military response. In the 18th century already, you have what we call jihads, Muslim wars, which are actually led by more clerics in the 18th century, but they will continue from the 18th century to the 19th century. The last holy war was led in this region by a cleric called Muhammad Dramme, and it's the last, 1890. What showed that it really last is in 1895, the French will create the Federation of French West Africa, which is really the end of the military expedition. The French have, quote unquote, as they say, pacified the region and are controlling that. But what is interesting with the Holy Wars here is the emergence of the first theocratic states. From roughly 1725 to 1787, uh, you had one Muslim state here, Bundu. You have one here which is contemporary of the um, American Revolution, 1776 and you have a powerful one here. And the claim this theocracy are making are claims of rejecting slavery. They are against slavery. And they are good. But a very specific type of slavery, the Atlantic one. They don't want, you know, the selling of Muslims, quote unquote. And they are trying through their jihads to revise the economy which was centered in Messiah. So this is the way in which slowly Islam became a part of the political, social, and cultural language of this region. And it's a vernacular Islam. It's not a, a, a Moorish Islam or an Arab Islam, but it's slowly African appropriating uh, the, the religion and uh, dealing with it in their own in, in their own term. And what happened at the end of the French uh, at the end of, uh, of, of the French expansion is the emergence of, of a new of a new leadership the emergence of new Muslim cleric which are redefining the notion which are the divine pronunciation of the yeah. Hello. Yes. Advocating military jihad. They are redefining the notion of jihad which became both personal and collective. But in a context which is a context of crisis, at the end of the 19th century, the consequences of slave raiding, the consequences of, of the conflict between Muslims and uh, traditional authorities, but between also Muslims and slave traders, have created a situation which was very difficult for, for the population. And the idea of community has also begun, uh, you know, being revised. What the new generation of cleric brought with them was a new idea of community. 
which is defined on religious principle. And they were able to attract more and more people. But the second element which became important, which enabled them not only to resist but to protect their community, is they began engaging in the production of peanuts. The slave trade was conducted by warriors because the slave was produced by war. But peanuts created a completely new situation in which the peasant was in a position to sell his production. And the clerics were able to play the role of intermediaries. And the first thing they bought after selling their peanuts were a gun. <laughs> So peanuts allow them actually not only to be able to reconstruct their community, but it's allow them also to protect, to protect their community. So my this very quick presentation, uh, you know, I think allow me to to, to say that. Sufi Islam in Senegambia is best understood as a distinctive reaction to the imposition of colonial rule and for the composition of the moral, cultural, and economic narratives and practices of traditional communities. And this has to be kept together to understand even what is going on today. And which language, which resources people are using. Because my main argument that is that the model is based on narratives and ways in which those narratives are constantly recreated to deal with new events. But because they are discursive, as resources, they also open a space for negotiation, always. Because it's constantly refrains. And what the Sufi will offer is precisely the site, the space. The material culture to rehearse the text, but also to revise them. So it's why, again, today in the discussion about Islam in Africa, those processes have given have opened a kind of discussion around was Islam Africanized or were Africa Islamized? The Africanization of Islam or the, the, the idea, but, but, but you have both, you know, the kind of doctrinal mode of spirituality which is based on maintaining Islamic libraries for very, very specific purposes, from religious purposes to political purposes. But you have also the kind of imagistic visual Islam, where icons are much more important than the text. So the tension between textuality and uh, material culture is also a very powerful element in maintaining the model. Right? have uh, the model I have, I have talked about. And, 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 and if you want to understand the model, we have to go through the, the moment in which, uh, during which the French began developing what they called their politic musulman, Muslim politics. The French claim as early as the, the end of the 19th century against the Ottomans that they were a Muslim power. And they, 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 their approach, their, their policy 
from Algeria to Senegal was a policy uh, where policies which were trying to address the need of the Muslim. But the Muslim defined in a very, uh, you know, essential, essentialized way. It, it was a kind of Muslim unable to adapt to, uh, you know, the language and, and culture of citizenship, for example. When in many cases, you know, uh, the, the, the Muslim of the fourth commune, for example, has been uh, keeping the two together. On one hand, claiming that they were Muslims and they had to defend their Muslim rights. On the other, the resources of citizenship were their resources they were allowed to use. So the reconciliation the French believed the impossible was precisely the arrangement which defined the identity of the people of the, the four communities. So when we look at the different moment in the development of, 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 of French Muslim policy, we could actually identify a first phase which was largely inspired by Algeria and the colonial resistance of Sufi leaders. Abdul Kader played a key role in trying to stop the French in 1830. And that moment actually qualified the Sufi Brotherhood as enemies. The French decided that they were enemies. So they had to be fought. The second phase is characterized by the creation of what the French called the Bureau des Affaires Indigènes in 1844. And the idea is to collect through those uh, officers information and include Muslim into the political system. The French literally invested a lot in studying Islam. And what happened in the early 20th century, in particular around a man who has defined until probably the 70s, the approach to Islam uh, is uh, Paul Marty. Marty has published 20 books on Islam in different parts of West Africa. But he has published in particular in 1917 a book on, which is called uh, Studies on Islam. And he will really define the difference between what he called white, literal, literate and textual Islam around the Sahara and in North Africa and what he will call Islam Noir black Islam. And this paradigm has actually dominated approaches to Islam uh, among the Francophone until probably the late 80s. And this, this distinction will have a key role also in uh, actually characterizing political Islam and tolerance. To black, what is associated to black Islam is tolerance. But the tolerance is premised on ignorance. They are tolerant because they are ignorant. So the idea is to do whatever you need to stop the intolerant Islam of the Arab to infiltrate the tolerant Islam of the blacks. And this has created a kind of very, very interesting situation. And if I go back to the four communes, what has happened is, has early as the you know, mid-19th century, the French have been busy helping the, the urban Muslims. 1857, was created a Muslim tribunal in Saint Louis to 
to deal with the issues, you know, legal issues. But the interesting thing, if you go, I went through the archives of the Muslim tribunal, the term Sharia is never used. It has never been qualified as the Sharia. But the courts were the result of the Muslim inhabitant of San Luis fighting for that. In 1860, the French were forced to create a commission to help Muslims from San Luis to go to pilgrimage. It still exists, that. The committee still exists. And the French kept organizing these caravan for the pilgrimage, for the pilgrimage, pilgrimage to, to, to Mecca. But it's also the period during which uh, the inhabitants of Sami, but also after 1880, the inhabitants of Rifis and Dakar was able to open the public space and include Muslim institutions in the colonial public space. And it's one of the most important elements. And the culture which enabled actually the four communal citizens to do it was a culture of petitioning. They understood very well that to exist in the colonial public space, you have to have a voice. And the way of having a voice, the, the mechanism through which you get into it, it's through petitioning. But it's through also creating your own network of, of charity organization. It was also opening space for debate. Mosque became key, and people, successful traders, creating their own mosque in order to open a space of interaction among Muslims outside the supervision of the outside the supervision of the colonial state. So, if you want, the model is the product early of this age. But what happened now in the territory of direct control is quite different. The Islam is emerged in the rural areas is much more a brotherhood Islam constructed around a sheikh, a saint who has the baraka. To the sheikh, a space is associated the only city of the brotherhood. And it's the Murid's brotherhood holy city is Tuba here, which was created at the end of the 19th century by Amadi Baba. They are the most successful and the most powerful uh, brotherhood. The second, the largest one, is here, Tibawa. So you have a Murid here, you have a Tijan here, and you have another small group of people small. I say small, uh, in Senegal they are small, but it's a group, uh, a Tijani group, which is in Kaulak here, but which is the largest Muslim brotherhood in Africa with 25 million followers, you know, from Senegal to Sudan today, but also, but also, also Nigeria. So, so, so it's, it's Islam which is built, structured around a saint, around a holy place, around tombs, and around pilgrimage. To give you an example, every year when you have the Magal, which is the celebration of the return from exile of the founder of Omuri, you have more than three million people for one week in this place. And they are coming from all over the world. 
Every time you see a Seneca is wherever, he's probably a Mori. You see him in the North Pole or in China. <laughs> because this is part, the, the, uh, in the paper in public culture is what I was trying, what I was showing that, that they are globalized, losing, losing a language which is supposedly a local language, but which is a language of a modernity produced by the interaction with the whites, with the interaction with the post-colonial state. But the organization of the brotherhoods are very different from the Muslim uh, uh, system which was created in contact and in confrontation or collaboration with the French in the four communes. It's a, one is literate, the other is much more uh, imagistic. You know, to borrow the vocabulary of White House. So, so it's, a, it's, it's not textual, or at least it was not textual until they began migrating in the late uh, 1970s. So, if we look now at the way in which the French were able to negotiate these two Sufi cultures, was that in the early 20th century when they decided to set a kind of, uh, of system which is an indirect system, they relied first on traditional chiefs, but they were so corrupted that they were forced actually to exclude them from the indirect government system they put together. And they began incorporating the Sufi leaders. The Sufi leaders became very quickly the, 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 the intermediaries. And the system began taking shape and shifted slowly from becoming, from being a kind of informal system to being formalized. And, and, but it was formalized along the line, the authoritarian line of, of the colonial system. It's the other very fascinating thing. And for a historian like me, it's sometimes very complicated and very dangerous. When I say the brotherhoods are the product of colonial intervention, they reinvented them as institutions. Of course, for people who are into it, it's worse than an insult. But, but, but if you look even at the vocabulary which is used, the head of a brotherhood is always called Caliph General, General Caliph. <laughs> but it's coming from an expression, which is the Governor General. The colonial governor is a Governor General. And it's coming, it's coming directly from there. It was, the, the colonial system was appropriated and redefined by Sufi clerics. To be able actually to negotiate, with, to be able to deliver, to be able to collect taxes, they had to maintain a system of subordination, a strict system of subordination. But it allowed also the French to be able to negotiate between different groups by letting the general caliph to administer his brotherhood and policing, but by also policing the borders between his brotherhood and other brotherhoods, and the French supervising the French supervising the, 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 the whole system and the policing, the internal policing and the policing of the borders are are very 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 important. And I think is what explain how the system was actually uh, built on a base of to tolerance or toleration. Because it was the <clears throat> intervention which allowed to build two systems for colonial rule, 
a, an administrative system which allowed the French to, to basically administer things, but also administer people. People were not governed, they were administered. Because when you are governed, uh, you are represented. These are systems where people are not represented, so they are administered. But how do you translate the language of French administration into the local vernacular? But it's precisely what the cleric did through the Islam world model. They were able to give a basis to the system, a legitimization. They legitimize the system by being able to translate it and by engaging constantly in a logic, which is a logic of, 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 of translation, and by providing a tie between the uh, cleric and his disciple. The disciple who is in a kind of very paradoxical situation. One, he has to actually respect the authority of the clerics. He has to accept the orders given by the clerics. His white clerics were able to tell them, you have to cultivate peanuts, and they will go to cultivate peanuts. They will tell them, you have to vote for X. They will go and vote for X. In exchange, when they have a problem, the cleric has to fix it. If they want the kid to have, let's say, a place at school and they have problem finding a place for him, uh, the cleric has to solve it. Because at the same time that it's a very directive system, it's also a system which is based on the freedom of a disciple to change credit if he's not happy with the one he has. If his Malabu, as we say in Senegal, is not able to fix his problem, he can go to a more efficient manner. So, so, so it, it, it's a give and take, and the give and take is very, very important. But the control of the control of a disciple by the Manabu enabled the Manabu to, to, to actually locate themselves within the colonial system in a very, very powerful position. And at the same time, as I was saying, they were able to ne negotiate their way. They were able to gain from the system. And the interesting moment is the moment of a transition to independence, the moment of decolonization after World War II, with, in particular, the creating, you know, the establishment of national parties and the beginning of not necessarily a discussion about independence, because it's probably one of the differences in different situations in West Africa. For many years after World War II, the discussion was not about independence. You had many options which were there. The first option was the option of becoming French, becoming French citizen. And the French have pushed for that to avoid decolonizing their empire. For them, the response of the imperial crisis was granting citizenship to the colonized in there. The second discussion which was important was a discussion about borders. And this is the most important discussion among the nationalists and politicians. People were advocating the creation of nation within colonial borders. And people were advocating the creation of states or the African state, Pan-Africans were saying, you need a continental state. And you have more restricted Pan-Africans as Senghor, who was saying, the colonial federation should be the basis of a new nation. And you had the 
quote unquote radicals who are for independence, but with diff different context. And uh, the discussion was conducted by African, but it was sold by the gold in this region. When the Gaulle returned to power in 1958, he decided to organize a referendum. You know, you have to, to, to imagine that the Gaulle came back to power because he was actually supported by the right wing, in particular the uh, Algerian colonials, which are uh, the European which were uh, living in Algeria, thinking that he can save them when he finally decided that the only option was independence. For West Africa, he decided to organize a referendum. Yes, for independence within the French Union, and no, for independence outside the French Union. In Senegal, the discussion was interesting. The politicians decided that they were for independence outside of France and outside the French Union. And the Sufi clerics who had already set up their own organization decided that they were for independence within the French Union. And they told the politician, fine, you can go and campaign for the no. We are going to campaign for the yes. And we have more disciples than you have militants. So you are going to lose. Why not join us? And actually the politicians were forced to join that. And accepted to campaign for independence within the French Union. And for the whole of West Africa, only one country voted for no, Guinea. It's the only country, because it's the only country where you did not have solid and constituted Sophie Brokers. It was the most fragmented country, but it was also the country where you had still a large minority, non-Muslim minority, uh, you know, following African religions and a large, and a quite large also Catholic minority, which is not the case for a country like Senegal where 96 of the population is Muslim. So, so, so this situation was an important moment in West Africa. The fact that the Sufis, uh, clerics were able to transition from colonial rule to to, 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 to the post-colonial state, uh, understanding quite clearly that they had to renegotiate the deal of the Islam world system. So, first phase, politicians were defeated. They were forced to join. Second phase, at independence, the clerics came back and asked for a Muslim constitution. They told the politicians that they wanted a Muslim constitution. And the politicians say no. And the politicians defeated them. Again, this is what shows the, the kind of flexibility the systems allow. That in a first political engagement, the religious were the winners. But in the Second engagement, which was much more about, you know, the place of religion into the new political system, we politicians were able to resist the demand of, of, of the demands of, 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 of the cleric. And, and this was also an important element for two reasons, because it will really define ways in which the discussion about the organization of the relation between the state and religion uh, will be conducted. And basically, it's about three leaders, which are the three most important leaders of, of independence, who have different positions and who are trying to situate themselves 
in relation to a group which is formally out of a political system, but which is much more powerful in terms of mobilization. The first politician, his name is Lavin Gay. He was born in San Luis, and he's really part of his very literate Muslim culture, but it's also the first African, the first Francophone African uh, to defend a PhD in law. But his first, his original job in the, the, the before going to college was that he was the interpreter of Islam for the colonial administration. So he knew very well Islam. He was an erudite, but at the same time, because of his training and because of his political engagement, he was a French socialist, and he was defined. His party was defined by red, you know, the color red. But he was an adept of French laicity, separation of the church and the state. He didn't want the Marabou into the political system. He didn't want them. And he fought for that. And he lost because of, of that. And one of the one of the jokes which is said about him is that in the fifties when he was running for uh, for representative at the French National Assembly, he was told that he has to go here in Tiwawan and talk to the Halif general of Batiga to get his support because Senghor has already the support of Tuba and Senghor is his rival. So he said, if you want to be elected, you have to go and get some support from the Halif general. And people were insisting because he went to Quranic school with the Halif general. <coughs> but the problem was simple. If he goes there to win his support, he has to accept to be the disciple of this man. He went to Quranic school with. And it seemed that his reaction was to say, which is today one of the key problems of the, the, the leadership of the Sufi program. He said, I will never accept to be the disciple of this man. I was a better student than him. I know better the Quran than this man. Why should I go? Because he has followers who are unable to read the Quran. So, but the effect is he lost because he did not get the support of the head of the TGM who went to support. The second man who was the Prime Minister of Senegal at Independence was Mamadou Dia. And Mamadou Dia was a, a modernizer. He was not a Salafist, but he didn't believe on Sufi Islam, which was for him uh, not literally to Africa. But he wanted also to create a mass party. But the whole system was based on the fact that you reach, you reach out to a Senegalese citizen only through the Sufi brotherhood system. You cannot go around it. What he wanted was to destroy the system in order to be able to recruit militants for the party. And he tried to do it in a kind of very interesting way. As a prime minister, he decided basically to recruit the son of his leaders and send them to Cairo, al aqsa Just betting that they will turn a little bit Salafist, a little bit, which they did actually. After two years, they came back, created an association which was called the Cultural Association of Muslim of Sen and went after their parents. 
They lost also after two years. They were completely unable. They came back and uh, today carrying the legacy of their parents. The last politician was Senghor. And the interesting thing is that Senghor was a Christian. He was not a Muslim. <laughs> but he is the one who understood very clearly that the only possibility, actually, of establishing a stable system was to reimagine, to reinvent, to reshape the old model. And as early as 1948, <coughs> when he created his party, he selected, I told you that in Gay's party's color was red. Senghor selected, you can guess, green. <laughs> and, but he said that it was because he represents the rural areas. Because he was making this opposition between the four communities and him representing the masses. But you know, but it was not only was he Christian, but he was educated in he was educated in France, and it's someone who had real problem speaking Wolof. I told you Wolof was the language of France, but he imposed himself by understanding the logic of a system, a system which was set by the French, and he became the representative of the Brotherhoods. He began representing them. And he was seen as the only politician able to understand peasants, able to deal with their problem, but also able to use their language. And as I say, the language was basically, you know, the language of Islam or one of the Islam or of model. For someone who was neither Muslim nor a good locator, nor a good locator of Wallach. But he imposed himself and in 1962 he arrested and jailed Mamadouja for 14 years. And for 14 years, one of the most interesting uh, even coming on and on was every year the Archbishop of Dakar, who is a cardinal, who is from the same ethnic group as Senghor, will keep petitioning Senghor to liberate this man, who was a Muslim, in a kind of little bit close to a Muslim radical. And for 12 years, this is the man who was going every year visiting the jail ex-Prime Minister. The Muslim cleric has never asked Senghor to release him. This is also part of this culture I try to, to, to present very quickly, which is a culture in which you don't have fixed position and stable position. People are circulating and using the culture which is generated by their interaction, by their interaction differently. But what happened in the 70s, 1970s, is a crisis which is uh, the consequences of, of a cycle of creating an informal culture. And the man who has, the, the caliph who had supported Senghor, so strongly died in 68. You have to imagine in 68, and all over the world, you have a very intense uh, you know, student movement in Senegal. And Senghor is really in a very, very delicate position. He will ask the man in Tuba to help him. And he threatened to send his disciple to attack the university. His brother will shift and go towards a demand which is revising the system. 
that the system should be renegotiated. But the renegotiation is based on trying to pull the Muridin party outside the arrangement, the colonial arrangement. He wants to redefine the space of his, his own. And he has a project, is the building of a city, of a holy city. But the holy city which belongs to his brother. <coughs> and the most spectacular thing he will do in 1972 was to create a library and a printing house to accompany the migration of these people. And it will change completely the dynamic of, of the group. But he will also advocate competition between his brotherhood and the other brotherhood, blurring the line, you know, of a policing system I have been talking about, the policing inside and the policing outside. But he will also try to create a new dynamic which is why do we need intermediaries to control the the state, why not control it directly? And he began mobilizing his disciples, in particular the politician, with the idea that they should take over the system. And what will be elected in 2000 was one of those disciples. And what will play a key role in changing the language of a system by claiming that he was elected by the Murid. He represents the Murid. The Murids are the more dynamic poly, uh, economic actors of Senegal. As a reason, they will take over, they will control <coughs> and push actually the other brotherhood who have been part of a system in the margin. And the reaction with the more powerful reaction against the turn of the Muni is by a no longer Soyan cleric who is from Tiwawan, who is a Tijani, who is an intellectual. He was trained uh, in a French high school, Finnish high school, went to Cairo uh, to learn Arabic and Islam. From Cairo arrived in France in the early 70s uh, to learn interpretation and translation, Arabic, French, and English. Became a communist, but head of a communist uh, student chapter of the French Communist Party, but also became a performer. He played, you know, in a lot of TV movies in France. And he's a son of one of the most important clerics of Senegal. And he's today the one who's leading a kind of discussion around revising and redefining the, 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 the model, which seems to be at the end of his course. And one of the interesting things with this uh, cleric, whose name is uh, Mansur C, is that he cited al Stepan and Rajiv. <laughs> To, to talk about, you know, respect for all, the equidistance. This whole discussion today in Senegal is about the equidistance. With what? We had, we had 12 years where the state was, and, and the fact that the first act of one when he was elected in 2000 went, was to go to visit the Khalif of Umuri and sat on the floor a genuflection of one. For a year and a half, the whole discussion in Senegal was about that. The state sitting on the floor in the living room of the Khalif. And this has opened a discussion. And the discussion, and I will stop there, is important for many reasons. One is what we are experiencing is a kind of end of this long history of the making and maintenance of the modern. 
Today, the model is no longer fitting for basically three reasons. One reason I talked about it is the fact that the economy which supported it was an economy of, of submission and a logic which was a logic of uh, an authoritarian structuring which allowed the head of the system to impose always a direction. The disciple had some space, but not a lot of space to contest. What he has to negotiate is to gain from the system, not to contest it. But the people who were marginalized in the system, which were basically women and the youth, have been accumulating new resources and have, been, have access to new information. And in particular, if only the creation of a library and, and the printing has democratized the access to knowledge. People are now able to read and interpret. And what we have today within the programs are people who are saying we are against the genealogical logic. Because the logic of the caliph is a logic where it's inheritance from father to son. But the last son of the, of the founders passed away. The last one passed away two years ago. So the era we are in is the era of the grandson. They are less charismatic. They are much more involved in worldly things. You know, they like nice cars. They, you know, these are people who buy Bentleys and Jaguars, you know, they have luxury taste. So the, the disciples are beginning to question that. But they are also shifting their allegiances, saying their loyalty is, for some their loyalty is to the Holy City. What is important is the Holy City, and they have to deal with Others are saying what is important is the function of the caliph. And they will serve the caliph, but they are no longer serving these families. In particular, the crisis is the crisis around the grandsons. And the logic around the grandsons are also logic which are changing. People who are benefiting from the old system and people who are trying to change it. I mentioned Mansur C. I can mention uh, one of the young leaders of the Murid who is much more interested in, in, in creating an uh, 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 institution of, of education and in trying uh, to, to build new systems which are able to incorporate religious education but also vocational education which are trying to pull together French, Arabic, and English. Why English? English because the largest group of Murid migrants are living in New York, near Colombia. They are living in Harlem. So English is becoming the language of, of, of this group. And, and by pulling them together, he thinks that he's able to engage in a kind of renovation which is reimagining an intellectual rethinking of Sufis. Because what has happened in the early phase, the last third year, was that very trained young people and send them to al -Aqsa. And what has happened all the time is 90% of these young people were sent to Egypt, al -Aqsa, to learn Islam. 90 to 95% will come back Salafist. Attacking them actually. Now his idea is to create a university in Senegal. And in December, with Karen Baki, we are going to organize a conference on Sufi Islam there in Tuba with him because he, he wants to engage 
he wants to engage in a discussion in the West. And you have a third response to this uh, moment of reimagining the, the, the arrangement is if you want marginal, in particular among the Murids, who are trying to take over the whole system, but whose language is neither literate or professional, but which is the, the, the old language of Baraka. And for two of these people, the, the most interesting aspect is they are even not literate Muslim. One of them keeps saying, I cannot read the Quran, but the power I have, I got it from one of the Murid Sheikh who died a few years ago. Uh, his name is Betul Kuhn, and he's interesting because he's a former communist. He was trained as a lawyer, and it's true that he knew he cannot read the Quran, but he had, but he's able to actually uh, mobilize for you for one simple reason. In a country where close to 70% of the population is under 25, in an environment defined by the crisis of education and the impossibility of finding a job, you know, this kind of new religious structure, which has nothing to do with, uh, you know, political Islam, are very attractive because they are offering one thing. And it's amazing. They are just offering one thing. The possibility for teenagers to marry. This man has been marrying every weekend something like a hundred people. <laughs> yes. And he's doing it. And if they have kids, they will be named. The boys will be named after him. And the girl will be named after his seven wife. And he will pay for the ceremony, and he will give them some money. And he is attracting thousands of kids on all of that basis. And it's very interesting because he's able to engage in a discussion, in a political discussion with uh, the, with the politician. So, so these are the three trends. About you know, is it is the model at at risk? I. For I cannot say, but what is absolutely clear is the model is under siege. And it's coming from, on one hand, uh, you know, political Islam, fundamentals, but it's also coming from within because of a necessity of redefining it, of adjusting it in this new moment for the 21st century. But it's already having an impact on the whole political system. Because since 2000, what had really changed, and I didn't say that, what had really changed is the fact that from the colonial period to 2000, the Halif general of each of his brotherhood was able at each election, like this, if this was selling out today, you will have all these Marabu showing up on TV and telling, if you believe on me, if you believe on my ancestor, you vote for X. And this is prescriptive. In 2000, it shifted. It was no longer possible to do that because of the changes economic, cultural, but also changes of just location which has happened. So we have a new president since 2012. And it was a man who had campaigned, his first campaign day was to say, the clerics are ordinary citizens like any other citizen. And he was attacked. And he's still attacked on such a basis. And I think that this is the illustration of how this discussion and how the, the kind of trajectory of Islam or world of order has been 
has been going. And as I was saying, at least for uh, the Senegalese intellectual elite, part of a discussion is very much influenced by what is happening in India since independence. So thank you.